I'm Mark Klepker, the Director of Education at the Cyber Center for Education and Innovation out of the National Cryptologic Museum, which is housed at Fort Meade, Maryland. Uh, so we're coming to you from that beautiful state out on the East Coast. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and you are in for a treat today. We have Mr. Jeff Mann who's with us. He has over 37 years of, of working in all the different aspects of computers particularly in, in vulnerability analysis and, and crypto analysis, crypt, crypto analysis, et cetera. That's how I met him when we were both at, uh, at the National Security Agency in doing penetration testing and what we used to call, well, we probably still do call, uh, the red teams, uh, et cetera. So I really appreciate, Jeff, you being with us today. And so with that brief introduction, I'm going to hand it over to you and, and let you take off. All right, Mark, thank you very much. I am going to share my screen. Very briefly, I'll start with my background just to let you know sort of who I am and where I am today, and then we'll backtrack of you know how I got to where I am. Uh, again, primarily focused on what I did at NSA. I have a day job, of course. Uh, I am a consultant and advisor. I work with companies trying to help them secure their organizations, secure their environments, particularly in the areas of what's called pay, the payment card industry or PCI security, which is all about the security of payment card information, credit cards, debit cards, things like that. As a side job, and one of the ways that I, I try to give back to the community is I am a co-host on a webcast that's called Paul Security Weekly. We have won an industry award the last three years running as the most educational security webcast podcast. Uh, I've been working with them for about uh, six years now. Because I talk PCI and compliance so much, they actually about eight months ago gave me my own show. So now I'm the host of what's called Security and Compliance Weekly. You can find either of these shows at securityweekly.com. I am also uh, part of a card game, which is kind of cool. There's a, a, an organization out there called Hack for Kids, which is devoted to teaching hacking skills to young people. So take note. Uh, if you want to learn uh, about the history of hacking and freaking, especially computer hacking, they produced this uh, interactive fantasy game called Freaker Life, and you can get there. That's the website, freaker.life. Uh, it's been out for about three years now. Amongst the, the playing cards are face cards that they call anachronisms, and I was privileged enough to be asked to be one of the original set of anachronists, if that's the right form of the word. I share this because this is a good educational tool if if you or can talk your teachers and your schools into getting a hold of a couple of these decks. It's a good way to learn sort of the ins and outs of the history of hacking and freaking. Freaking is primarily hacking the phone system, which is kind of where we started before we got into computer hacking. There's also a series of books that have been published the last uh, two years or so called Tribe of Hackers fourth one, the blue edition, is actually not out yet. It, it's coming in um, August, I believe. These are books that are, the format is uh, the editors uh, gave a bunch of people in the industry that are known as leaders and influencers a set of questions on specific topics and had everybody respond to the same question. So every chapter of the book is different people answering the same questions. Uh, so it gives you a real broad uh, perspective on where people are coming from into all sorts of different topics within this, this world of computer security, cybersecurity, uh, starting from the original tribe of hackers. There's one that dedicated to the red team, obviously security leaders and the blue team. I'm also known as a Jedi master. I, I give a, a lot of talks at conferences and I actually got a, uh, an escort one time a couple of years ago. So I captured the photograph. I give a talk uh, that's all about uh, effective communication skills and I call it the art of the Jedi mind trick. So uh, you can find that on YouTube, art of the Jedi mind trick, type in my name and there's several versions of that out there. A synopsis of my career, I spent 13 years working for the Department of Defense at the beginning of my career. The bulk of that 10 years or so was at NSA. I left the NSA in 1996, and I've been in the private sector ever since uh, doing 
some facet of, of uh, cybersecurity, mostly from the consulting perspective, going into companies and, and trying to help them figure out how to do their security programs. As I said, the bulk of that has been doing PCI. Cryptography comes a lot uh, up comes up a lot in terms of protecting data, encrypting it, whether it's uh, being stored on a computer or in a database or in a file somewhere, and primarily as it's being transmitted back and forth. Uh, you know, you go to a department store, you go to a convenience store, you you. Uh, dip your card is what they call it these days, your credit card or your debit card. All that data gets read and, and usually these days encrypted and sent on to ultimately your bank to say, yep, you've got a balance, you've got credit, you can go ahead and make your transaction. So I want to talk a little bit about the things that I did uh, at NSA. I was there for 10 years and I roughly had sort of three careers at NSA, three major assignments, and, and I'll walk through them. I actually started uh, at NSA in 1986, and it was very popular back then. Uh, this this little sign uh, showed up a lot. If you're not familiar, there's a rather famous novel called 1984. It's a dystopian novel written by a gentleman named George Orwell that refers to the government being Big Brother, and that's uh, a reputation that NSA has. So this was just sort of a little thing that's floated around a lot at NSA, uh, kind of snickering that, you know, we hadn't really kept to the schedule. We weren't as dystopian as, as the uh, book, which was written, gosh, back in, help me, Mark, 40s or 50s. I'm not sure exactly when it was published. Uh, yeah, that's a really old one. It is. Uh, might even go back to the 30s. For a little bit of historical context, you may have uh, seen this device uh, bef- somewhere in your travels. Uh, if you've had any exposure to spy movies or anything involving with cryptography, this is actually a, a picture of what's called the Enigma machine. This is the uh, encryption device that was used by the Germans during World War II. To put it in context, when I started it at the National Security Agency back in 1986, the fact that the Allies had broken the cryptography of this device was still a secret. It was not declassified uh, until the late 80s. And, and the reason being, quite simply, there were still nation states out in the world that were still using the device. So this is probably one of the best examples that I know of of how NSA does what it does historically and and takes the idea of keeping secrets of the fact that we had broken the crypto on this. Obviously, if countries had known, if the Germans had known that we had broken it back during World War II and in the years following, they would have stopped using it. We as a country, as a nation, would have lost a very valuable information resource. I mentioned three careers. My first career is I started off in what was known at the time as the Information Security Directorate. So it was sort of the defensive side of the house. That side of NSA was responsible for securing the communications and all the secrets and sensitive data of the U.S., of the military, of the State Department, and so on and so forth. So that part of the organization was building cryptographic devices, primarily back in those days, it was telephones and radios. A lot of the communications back then was done over the radio. In fact, even sometimes Morse code. So I I went to work for an organization that was responsible for what was called manual crypto systems. What are manual crypto systems? Primarily, as you'll see on the picture to the left here, something called a one-time pad. I'll go into detail of how it works a little bit. So this is just sort of very briefly the things that I did at NSA. But we'll get back to how a one-time pad works in just a little bit. One of my first assignments in this office was I had a customer that was using something that was very new at the time, uh, an IBM PC, a desktop computer. And they were had the responsibility for communicating with people that were like other side, perhaps think spy novels, uh, think espionage. And um, they were complaining that it took them hours sometimes to, to write, to encrypt or decrypt the secret messages that they were creating with this one time pad. And they asked simply, is there some way we could use this computer to do this work? Cause it just takes too long. And, 
I being young and naive thought, yeah, why not? That makes a whole lot of sense. So I ended up being a project manager and producing what was called at the time a semi-automated one-time pad, where we took the key that is printed on these one-time pads and produced that key on a floppy disk and then wrote a computer program that would do the decryption and the encryption, essentially the algorithm, the math that was involved in creating the secret messages and then translating them back into English. To my knowledge, and this, this would be a, a good challenge for the museum, to my knowledge, was this was the first software-based crypto system that NSA was produced, uh, ever produced. It wasn't exactly the, the crypto that we know of today with computers and technology, but it was the first venture. I know it was the first venture because I was told repeatedly by management, we don't do this. We don't do software. NSA does hardware. NSA builds little boxes but I took it on to change things. Also in my time in, in the first office, Mark, here's the wheel that I was telling you about. Uh, one, of my, one of my customers was U.S. Special Forces. They also used one-time pads and their algorithm for taking their messages. Again, I'll show you the details of how it works in a little bit. They would use a, a table that's called a visionaire table, which is, as you can see here, the alphabet written in reverse at 26 different offsets. So if you have this table and if you can think, well, I'll show it in detail how it works. But the, this table produced uh, 123 unique three-letter combinations that Special Forces was supposed to memorize. And so they could do the encryption and the de decryption in their head, speed up the process. As I was working with them, I did not have the, the, the benefit or the time to memorize all these trigraphs. And I had just been through some intro to cryptography courses, being new at NSA, learning about the history of cryptography myself. And I had learned about these things called cipher wheels. And I figured out, well, there must be a way to make a cipher wheel out of this visionaire table. And so I produced really originally just for my own benefit, a wheel that was two wheels sandwiched together. The alphabets reversed with a, a hidden alphabet on the inside, but a, a window that reveals the third letter. So you could just spin around, align the two letters that you were trying to connect to get the third letter. Long story short, as I was using it for my own benefit, when I was meeting with my customers, which were the communications officers from the various special forces groups, they liked it so much that we ended up producing 15,000 of these wheels and distributing it to U.S. special forces. I met somebody that was ex-special forces last summer who was an older guy and actually remembered using the wheel. And he has uh, been encouraging me to work with Mark and the, the Cryptologic Museum to get this wheel that was produced and used by special forces as near as I can tell for about 10 years, get it preserved, get the story of it preserved and put into the museum. My second tour at NSA, I became what was known as an intern. They had intern programs back in those days, which was a way of getting you sort of advanced training so you could advance in your career. So I became a cryptanalysis intern, and I moved over to the operations side of NSA, which is what NSA is mostly known for, intercepting communications from nation states and our adversaries throughout the globe and trying to figure out how to break the codes and ciphers uh, that others use to try to get information that would benefit you know, the national defense and national security. While I was there, it happened to be during the time of what was called the first Gulf War, which back then was called Desert Shield and Desert Storm. This was in the early 90s. So I actually participated in a real world mission at the time, being on the operations side of the house. Lots of stories I could tell, but just suffice it to say, I got to see NSA doing its thing you know, real, the real mission rather than just sort of planning and, and just sort of intelligence gathering. A, an actual real world war was going on. Also during that time, and you can look this up, I think it's online. There's a, a magazine called Wired Magazine, if you haven't heard of it. They published a story several years ago that talked about an analyst at CIA had broken the code that appeared on this weird statue that's in the courtyard of CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. I happened to visit this the headquarters of CIA on a field trip with this group of 
cryptanalysis interns, which was written about in this article that basically said NSA broke the secret message of this cipher that's actually a statue called Cryptos. And you can, again, Google it and find out more about it. But I was one of the interns that was there, as this sort of describes. We sort of uh, were a little offended that this cryptographic statue artwork was in CIA headquarters and not at, not at NSA. So we scribbled it down and copied it. Everybody took a different section and we brought it back and we attempted to break the, the secret message. Point of fact, there are actually four messages, separate messages in this statue. Three out of the four messages were broken very early on. The fourth message has never been solved. So if you have any interest in cryptography, I suggest you going out and Googling on this statue called Cryptos, Cryptos with a K, learn about it. You can find the cipher and you can take your hand at it. The artist has actually been giving clues over the last couple of years because he's getting older and he wants to see the the puzzle solved before he passes on. So that was sort of my second career. I can show you very briefly. This is a a copy and you can see the timestamp on it dated 1991. This is a copy that we printed out of the actual text of the ciphers that were in that statue. And I received my certification, my professionalization as a cryptanalyst, ultimately. My final tour sort of shifted gears. I went back to the InfoSec side of the house and I was working for an organization that would actually do security evaluations of the systems that had been fielded, designed, produced, and and fielded by NSA under the assumption that uh, somebody figured out at some point the way that a lot of systems from other nation states were broken by NSA very often were because the people that were using them didn't use them properly. They would, like a one-time pad, cannot be broken. It is completely secure as long as you keep both copies of the pad secret and destroy it after you use it. There's no way to cryptographically, mathematically figure out what the underlying message is. But if you use the one-time pad for a month, let's say, in, instead of just a single use, you introduce cryptographic vulnerabilities that can be broken. Or if it was a device or a machine, there might be some way to bypass the crypto portion of it or do some sort of shortcut that was unintended by the designers, but ultimately was a shortcut for the people using it, but also produced cryptographic vulnerabilities that were solvable. So somebody at NSA decided we should look at our own stuff and make sure that our people are using our systems, which are designed with you know, the best security possible to make sure that they're being used correctly. About the time I joined that office, uh, computer security was taking off and we sort of shifted gears, a, a small group of us, and we started looking at the not just fielding of cryptographic systems, but the security of computers and networks. Lots of stories here to tell, obviously, but uh, just to, the highlight is there's a book that was published uh, several years ago called Dark Territory, The Secret History of the Cyber War by a gentleman named uh, Fred, Fred Kaplan. Chapter four of that book is entitled Eligible Receiver. Within that chapter, there's this uh, paragraph that talks about, and it's kind of highlighted in the middle there, during its most sensitive drills, the red team worked out of a chamber called the pit, which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed, and even they couldn't enter without first passing through two combination lock doors. Long story short, I was part of the pit. The pit was actually located in an office building that's just west of BWI Airport in Maryland, uh, roughly in that corner of that particular building. And I was one of the members of the pit, which was actually six guys, two of which still work at NSA. Four of us out, are out in the private sector. The only p other person that I have the permission of sharing who they are is a gentleman here named Ron Gula, who is the founder of a company called Tenable Network Security. And he's... Uh, made a, a great name for himself as a, as a, uh, an entrepreneur in, in the cybersecurity space. Yeah. Jeff, uh, Ron was our kickoff, uh, presenter too. So. Oh, was he? Oh, great. So we've had two of the pit. You've had two of the pit and maybe we could get you a third. We'll have to negotiate that. That's great. 
So that's briefly what I did at NSA. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of stories associated with that uh, that I don't really have time for, but that's sort of the highlights of what I did at NSA. Then I came out into the private sector and I wanted to shift gears now and just talk a little bit about cryptography codes and ciphers. Again, lightning quick, as quick as I can go. There's really, you know, why do you, why do you want to protect the data? Why do you want to keep secrets? There's three reasons, classically. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality meaning keeping it a secret. You don't want somebody else to read it. Integrity meaning you want to make sure that the data, the information that you have, hasn't been altered or modified in some way. That the, the data that you're seeing, you can trust that it's r- the real data. And then finally, availability, the, you know, if you need to see the data, if you have some sort of time-sensitive demand for wanting to see certain types of data, you want to be able to get to it when you need to get to it. So those are sort of the classic reasons of why you want to keep secrets. And there's really two ways of doing that in a classical cryptographic sense, one which is codes and one which is ciphers. These terms are in modern times are sort of thrown around and used interchangeably, but there actually is a difference between the two. Some of the difference and the the highlights of the differences are described here, but basically codes are when you substitute something that has a different meaning to try to disguise what the underlining meaning is. Whereas cipher is you're taking the message, the data, and you're manipulating it in some way to try to keep it a secret. And there's two major ways that you do it. One is transposition, which is changing the order. And one is substitution, which you're switching characters, switching symbols to signify and hide the meaning of the underlying message. Some examples uh, from our history, probably one of the best known examples of codes was in World War II, you had the Navajo code talkers. They were communicating messages over the radio in the Pacific theater. Primarily the Japanese could never break the messages back. They couldn't break the code, but it wasn't simply because they didn't understand the native tongue of the Navajo that they were speaking. It was because the Navajo was using a code book where they would use words to mean different things. So like a tank was a Buffalo an airplane was an Eagle and things like that. So words were substituted for other symbols and words that had different meanings. That's a code. Other modern examples of codes, if anybody's ever seen the movie National Treasure, there's a a system, a a cryptographic system in there that they call the Ottendorf cipher. I actually sort of waffle on uh, whether this is a code or not, but essentially it was, uh, the way it was presented in the movie, they were getting letters of a message from a, a, a text and the, and the, the code, if you will, was, you know, like page number, paragraph number, and then the letter on the line of the, uh, of the paragraph or the sentence to say what well, that's the letter you want. It's debatable whether that's a code or cipher. Other examples would be like, it's not used so much anymore, but t- a telephone area code, the first three numbers of a telephone number back when they were usually landlines indicated a geographic area. Not so much these days with mobile numbers, which is what you're most familiar with, but even to some degree, the th- first three digits mean that your phone is coming from a provider in Maryland or coming from a provider in California or Kansas or wherever. Similar with the zip code that you have on your actual physical addresses for shipping, uh, you know, the address of your home has that zip code. That zip code means a particular post office in a particular geographic region and so on and so forth. Cypher, real, real quickly, a transposition system. C-Tech Astronomy is from a, a very famous movie called Sneakers. It's about hackers um, tying things together. But it's simply taking the letters that are there and putting them in different order to try to disguise the message. There's numerous ways that this has been done throughout history. Things where you have like a a grid that almost looks like a crossword puzzle on the left where you it's the same shape and you turn it four different ways and you write your message down in this square 
one character at a time, filling up the square, then you turn it and then you continue your message. And by the time you're done, it's all scrambled. The other thing here is a, a leather strap. And this goes back, I think, to Roman times where they would write the message on a, a piece of leather that was wrapped around a stick. And then when you unwind it, it's this big, long string of characters. And the person on the other end had to have the right stick of the right size in theory to wrap it around to get the actual message back again. Not saying it was a good method, but that's a, a historical method. Then you have a cipher desk, which is a, a, a simple substitution. And this is you know, my inspiration for the wheel that I created. This is one that was actually used during the Civil War. And it's a letter for letter substitution, which is otherwise known as a Caesar cipher. Why? Because it was used back in Roman times by Caesar. You're simply lining up your alphabet at some different pre-agreed upon offset and you're trying to substitute the letters in theory of misrepresenting in the old days we had these thing called newspapers with puzzle pages you can probably still find these in puzzle books maybe online but just simple substitutions of messages combined with just a letter for letter substitution is one common example Another type of cipher is something called a Playfair square, where you would create a grid and um, based on what was called a keyword, in this case, the keyword is monarchy, you'd write it into this square, you fill out the rest of the, the alphabet, and um, the way you would create your message is you would split up your message two letters at a time, and you would match on a diagonal like A and T, upper left to lower right. The corresponding letters are R and S to sort of create a square, which is why it's called a Playfair square. If they're on the same column, you move to the right. If you're on the same row, you move below. What all this stuff does, and this is getting more into the cryptography, is you're attempting to uh, hide the underlying message, obviously, but a substitution system and even a, 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 any kind of cipher, you're taking the frequency, the characteristics of the underlying language, in this case, English, and you're, you're not really hiding it anyway. And I can show you a brief example. I, I took the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, which is written out here, and I did a frequency count. I found a way to do this and graph it online. So this is all stuff that you can do yourself. And you can see that the distribution there is roughly the same as this. The most common letter in the English language is E, followed by R, S, and T, N, and O, and I, and A. Those are the ones with the highest frequency. When you do a, a simple substitution, you're switching it around, but in this case, the, the letter Y is the most frequent. And if you look up at the top, you know, we, the people has a lot of E's in the beginning of it, and you can see the Y is there. So if you're a cryptanalyst and you're trying to break the message, you go through and you substitute all the Y's for what you think is the letter E, and then you just look for patterns and you look for short words that will, you know, the first word that if the second letter is E, there's only so many two letter words in the English language and you can sort of by trial and error figure out what the message is. One way that you try to complicate that further is you could do more than one alphabet. So in this case, here's five different offsets. And so every letter that you would do uh, in terms of uh, encryption or creating the cipher, you would use a different line and you just do it in order so sequentially one through five and then repeat one through five what this looks like in terms of frequency is it, it starts to flatten things out so it makes it harder to pick out what are the e's and the, and the t's and the n's the most common letters as a, as a really quick exercise this is all based on the preamble to the, cons, the constitution I, i'm showing here uh, the distribution, if I was, if I had received that message and I'm trying to guess how many alphabets are, are deployed, I did a frequency count. There's the message, the original message. There's what English looks like. And here I tried to do, uh, let's say it's two alphabets. And you look at these frequency distributions based on two alphabets. It, it still looks pretty murky. 
same thing goes for the three. There isn't like a whole lot of distribution. And, and for example, in, in a short message like that, it'd be pretty rare to have all 26 letters used, or if a, a letter like a Q or a Z or a, a J is used, it's not going to be used consistently like that middle frequency table with all the other letters. So that doesn't look good. Four alphabets, it's looking a little bit choppier but there's still a lot of letters being used and and it looks kind of unusual. You get to the fifth alphabet and it starts to jump out. Hey, there's some significance, what we call peaks and valleys. As it turns out, this message that I encrypted using this five layer of uh, substitution is what it was. So, you know, you test it by, we know what the beginning is. We, the people, you highlight the letters that you know are the G, the, the E's and you try to keep track of which alphabet you're using. And so in this example, the second alphabet, the most common, the, you know, the, the biggest peak is this M and, you know, that is consistent with E. That's what we think it should be. Not so much on the fifth alphabet, but it's still high. The first alphabet, the next instance, yeah, that looks good, and so on and so forth. So it turns out it was five alphabets. Basically, in terms of cryptography, the way ciphers are broken are doing things like what I just saw, frequency analysis, counting the, the letters up, pattern matching, looking for words that are recognizable, especially short words. In the instance of where a key is employed, you recover the key somehow, you steal it, you figure out what the key is. Perhaps the key isn't random, but perhaps the key is generated in some way. Depth is something when, like I said, if you took a one-time pad and you used it more than once, you've got different messages, but they're all being encrypted with the same method, with the same underlying key. That creates conditions where you test it in one message and you, you take what you guessed is the key look at the others and when they all start to line up you know you've gotten the key right so on and so forth one-time pads this is where a key is employed in a classical sense this is what a one-time pad looks like i mentioned uh, the the one used by special forces i want to show you what it looks like a one-time pad is a page of random characters written out typically five characters at a, at a time because very often these messages were transmitted by Morse code and they can do five at a time because it's what somebody figured out is the best way to remember it if you're sending it and also if you're receiving it. So very quickly, you write your message out, you skip the first five characters because that's your key or your indicator to show on the receiving side what page you should actually use. Write out your message one letter at a time. You do that wheel table substitution. It produces cipher. And then on the other end, you write out your cipher. You know you've got the right page. You do the three-letter substitution again, and you get back to the plain text message. When you do something like use a one-time pad with a random key, your frequency distribution of your letters is, is what's called flattened out. There is no significant letters looking like it's the more common letters or the less common letters. Very briefly, in modern terms, uh, especially with computer-based cryptography, we're very often using keys now. We're using very complex algorithms, very complex mathematics to produce random, large sets of random keys, large sets of keys that can't be reproduced. They're hard to solve. They're hard to figure out what they are, even if you are using it over and over again. And there's two basic kinds. One is symmetric key, which is basically the same key is used to encrypt as it is to decrypt. A one-time pad is an example of a symmetric key system. In computer terms, it means both ends of the communication has to have a copy of the key. The other method then is, uh, and become probably the most popular, is what's called public key cryptography. And this is a method where there's key pairs. There's a what's called a, a public key and a private key, and they're related to one another. And you it, that want to communicate with somebody else, you give to somebody else the public key. You can give it to anybody. It's not secret. You give it to them. They use their public key to encrypt their message. 
they send it to you. And the only way that it can be decrypted is using your personal or your private key. And you do that in two directions. If you want to talk back and forth, you each have to exchange your public key with the other person, the other individual, the other destination. And you encrypt your messages using the public keys, you decrypt them using the private keys. Where this comes up mostly is in computers is on websites. You've most websites are encrypted these days and they're doing it with a public key cryptography algorithm of one form or another. Why? Because it's the fastest way. And more and more, we want speed. We want speed in our communications, which is why we don't use one-time pads anymore because they're cumbersome and slow, even though they're perfect cryptography. So lightning fast uh, covered a lot of years worth of cryptography, a very brief introduction to my time at NSA. With the time left, I'm happy uh, to answer any questions that I am able to. There are a lot of math involved in your career. There is necessarily a lot of math, although I don't use it uh, explicitly, but there's certainly a lot of math involved, especially in modern cryptography, where the keys that are being used are generated various mathematical methods, large prime numbers being the primary way that public key is uh, created the the theory which is yet to be broken is that very large prime numbers are hard to factor if you don't know what the factors are so the underlying premise of public key cryptography in particular and even symmetric key is very very com complicated and complex mathematical algorithms the premise being you're trying to come up with random that's been created and maybe is either copied over or can be created or reproduced on the other end, meaning both sides know the math to create this big complex stream of random. But in doing it in such a way that as it's being sent back and forth, it's very difficult to try to figure out what it is if you're not already on one end or the other. So yes, Matt, I don't do it directly. I'm not a mathematician, but it, it underlies just about everything. It's the premise of just about all cryptography these days, especially in the computer world. Okay. Uh, another question was, how long has cryptography existed? Thousands of years, like right. I said, you know, probably the earliest, uh, one of the earliest known methods that we know of is the Caesar cipher, which goes back thousands of years. There was other things that the Romans did to try to protect communications, uh, which weren't necessarily cryptographic in nature. But anytime you have a secret message and somebody's trying to steal it or figure out what it says, that's where cryptography comes in. Probably not terribly important, but when you're trying to break a code or a cipher, it's called cryptanalysis. When you're trying to create codes and ciphers, it's called cryptology. So the science, if you will, is cryptanalysis, but the, the disciplines are either cryptanalysis or cryptology. And um, I've done both. <laughs> right. right. Uh, another person wanted to know if you've ever come up with a cipher and what is your favorite cipher? I have necessarily come up with ciphers, you know, as part of my day job at NSA, especially in particularly the first part of my career. I do not know if they're still being used or not. I certainly wouldn't share them. I haven't done as much of that lately, although there's been occasions where, like I mentioned early on, that group Hack for Kids, which is trying to teach all these skills to young people. I've been involved in sort of a mentorship role with that group for a while. And uh, when they get together for their meetings, uh, conferences, they do lots of different activities and I get to be the one that does the crypto stuff. So I'll create classic but simple ciphers for kids to try to break you know, on the spot. My favorite is a one-time pad because right. it's not breakable. <laughs> well, I was a uh, old missileer in the ICBM field, and we used one-time mm -hmm. pads all the time for that uh, particular career field uh, because of the fact, like you said, it's a perfect cipher and very secure as long as you use it properly. That's right. Um, well, uh, one of the students said that he knew the Navajo code for grenade, and it was potato. So to <laughs> me, that sounds like a good a, a good substitution. Uh, in our uh, concluding minutes here, Jeff, 
you know, we've got several students online. Is is there some type of uh, recommendation you'd make for them on how they could get uh, involved in in either cybersecurity or ciphers uh, from a high school standpoint, or how to prepare themselves for for that career field? Coronavirus and 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 iso- you know self isolation notwithstanding, assuming that we get beyond that at some point. You know, so the short answer is virtually you can look for this, uh, but when you can start going back to conference, there's there's many security conferences throughout the country, and many of them offer sort of a, a young people track. I would recommend going to Hack for Kids, which is H A K four K I D S. They have a conference uh, in theory every year in Chicago. That's where they're based. They also have one, a couple other places, Milwaukee being one, usually affiliated with a hacker security mm-hmm. conference. Uh, going online and looking for something called Capture the Flag CTFs. There's more and more CTFs that are trying to tailor to younger people. There's more acknowledgement in general within the hacker security community that we need to teach the next generation. So there's more, uh, more and more efforts. But you know, if you're just looking online, look for any conference that these days are all virtual. Many of them have sort of a kid track or young people track to get plugged into. Just doing the research, go to YouTube and, and just find videos to watch. There's there's plenty of information out there. And and in the field of cybersecurity, there's so many different areas of expertise, areas of interest. Uh, I, I try to recommend to everyone, try everything, dabble in everything to find out, A, if, if you might have some aptitude or you're, or you're good at something. And hopefully you find something that you really enjoy doing, something that you get a charge out of. If you're lucky, they're the same thing. Jeff, thank you very much for being part of our cybersecurity series here. To those who have have joined us today, thank you for joining us. Please continue to watch NEPRIS and our particular uh, community, which is ccei.nepris.com, where we'll have all of our industry chats, which we call cybersecurity chats, posted. And Jeff, we look forward to you joining us again at a future event. Uh, We have some summer stuff coming up and also we'll get started again this fall. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nepris, for a a great opportunity to bring this information to to our students. Thank you, Mr. Lepko. Thank you, Mr. Mana as well. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.